December 2nd, 1804. Notre Dame Cathedral was, for this day, the center of the universe. Festooned in gold and red velvet with every great man and woman in Europe in attendance. It was the coronation day for the new French emperor. The Pope was to preside over the event, or so he thought. In the end, Napoleon crowned himself and his Empress Josephine, while the Pope looked on like a bystander and left early humiliated. Napoleon was the most powerful man in the world, and he wasn't going to be upstaged by anyone. Blind History Season 2, and we come to one of my top five people in all of history. I'm wearing his shirt, Napoleon, Emperor of the French, conquering and victorious general, statesman, artilleryman, officer, revolutionary, unbelievable human being, huh? 100%. He strode over Europe like a colossus. Anthony Medera, Gareth Cliff, and Blind History. Napoleon was a guy who dominated Europe for more than a decade in terms of his own presence, but arguably you could say a century. And I think his contribution to the world, which we'll get to a little later, is monstrous. He's considered one of the greatest commanders and victors of all human history. He redrew the map of Europe. And even after he was deposed, they had to redraw the map of Europe again. So you could argue that everything that's happened since is as a result of Napoleon's campaigns. Mm. And you were special, exactly like Charlemagne and um, Julius Caesar, Alexander the Great. Julius Caesar was his hero. He wanted to build an empire. Nobody in the 1800s by then were looking to build empires. Incredible. He well, especially really if you were born in a little town called Ajaxio in Corsica, mm. which I was actually in last week. And I went into <laughs> the house that Napoleon was born in. And it's a modest house. He came from a family of minor Italian nobility. His father was an ambassador to the court of Louis XVI. But he, he really didn't grow up as his mother's favorite. Joseph was the favorite. And he had a bit of an insecurity complex growing up because he was bullied a little bit at school and he was short. And, <laughs> you know, I think he also learned to be domineering as a result of that. But it's undoubtable that this guy had something really special going on because he was already a general at age 24. Once again, we look at his military, his career, and I said it before with Julius, and I said it before with Alexander, speed, speed, speed. He broke records on his horse getting from one part of, of France to the other, and people, are they here already? You know, they're always so shocked. <laughs> you mentioned his horse, Marengo, right? Marengo was yes, the, the famous horse. Now, there are a couple of, of other horses, and it's worth mentioning, shame, because we never really give uh, much attention to the animals, but since this is blind history, maybe the animal lovers will be pleased to hear this. So Marengo was... Napoleon's famous horse. Alexander had Bucephalus. That's right, yeah. And Caesar had a horse called Genitor, who helped him to conquer Gaul. And all three of them were phenomenal horsemen. Amazing. It was incredible. Well, it was, they did. it was kind of like being a really good rally car driver yeah. or racing driver today. But they all led from the front, and, and Napoleon was no different. So he is one, for, for me, he's in my top three. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay, that's high praise. By 26, he had campaigned against the Austrians. He was already commander of the French Italy army. He had won every battle that he'd ever taken part in. He'd conquered the entire Italian peninsula in a year and was a war hero by 1798. And they created power. And what he wanted was that power. Oh, yeah. Because the people now, the directorate in Paris, started realizing all oh, this guy's... He's starting to get a lot of power. And, you know, he made up the treaties himself, where the beaten parties were. He didn't refer back to Paris. No, he just had, the, he had them comply with his demands exactly. and made them sign. Yeah. He really springboarded his political career, though, with the expedition to Egypt, which is almost fabled now because it brought with it a rediscovery of ancient Egyptian history. He unearthed the pyramids. Mm -hmm. He collected artifacts and, and started, from an artistic point of view, this romance with Egypt that went into furniture, painting, sculpture, mm. and reignited a passion for that part of history. So we have him to thank for the fact that Egypt became famous again. And interesting, on a side note, one of the soldiers with him, Bouchard, mm. found the Rosetta Stone. That's and right, I mean, which that is allowed just... us to actually 
figure out what hieroglyphics exactly. were. Exactly. Yeah. So that was interesting. That was at that campaign in 1799. So you got quite a lot to thank him for and, and some things we won't thank him for, but he was already considered so important that by 1799 they made him first consul of France. This is a title that he borrowed from Caesar and from Rome. And there were two others, but nobody really cares about them. And all the paintings, they're seen in the background, and he's in the foreground. He was a, he was a very mighty man of some prestige and standing. And he certainly had the posture of someone who was important. Yeah. He had no lack of confidence. And he also had Talleyrand. Uh, and, you know, maybe we talk about Talleyrand at another time, but he was a master tactician himself. And he was, but especially in ways of how to structure like a chameleon he used to fit in with the Bourbons and then he fits in with the Jacobins. Yeah. Talleyrand was his foreign minister and in the end he, he be, was named a prince. That's right. And he supported him. He did it a lot. He brought the Pope on behalf of Napoleon. He made sure that they met and resurrected that relationship between France and, and the Pope. Well, it's interesting you bring the Pope up because by 1804, Napoleon had decided he didn't want to be consul anymore and now needed to be emperor. And he styled the idea of the French Empire on ancient Rome again and on his hero, Julius Caesar. And he had a coronation, a very elaborate coronation in Notre Dame, where the Pope was invited and the Pope was you know, of the opinion that he would be the one to crown Napoleon. And at the coronation ceremony, Napoleon actually took Josephine's crown, crowned her himself, and then took the the crown from the Pope and put it on his own head. <laughs> he, he didn't consider himself, himself subject to anyone, and the Pope kind of sat there with nothing to do and left early before the coronation ceremony had ended because he was really just a, an accessory to the, the whole thing. Yeah. So he, this guy had unbelievable power by that stage. He shattered coalitions. Remember, there were, by the end of it, seven coalitions against him of all the other neighboring states. The first and second coalitions hardly even raised their heads, and he destroyed them. Uh, he destroyed the Holy Roman Empire in 1805 after the Battle of Austerlitz, which was... That was his famous... That was one of his most famous battles. He just annihilated And them. strategically, he had these guys beaten. They were nowhere. Mm. Absolutely nowhere. And, and one thing he knew, he was not good on the sea. No. And he wasn't prepared to engage. When they said, at the time of the consul in the 1799, they said, listen, we, we give you permission to take on Britain. He said, no, I'm not taking on Britain. That's why he went to Egypt. Yeah. Because he could hurt them economically. And he was extremely intelligent. If we look at what he did with the economic, almost sanctions on Great Britain, it backfired on him to a great degree. But well, he closed off the Mediterranean largely. Exactly. And he said, look, that, I'm going to get you guys to come out. You know, he really wanted to pull them out. He was all about war. He loved to go to war. And he was hugely successful. So we mentioned Austerlitz. And then what happened after that is that the Prussians, newly formed Prussia, were quite nervous because he started to look like he was a threat on the continent and perhaps a threat to their sovereignty too. So they formed another coalition and he defeated them soundly at Jena and at Auerstedt. And he then went on straight after that to annihilate the Russians at Friedland in 1807, and really at that point he was probably at the most powerful he'd ever be. Um, he was emperor of France, he had complete mastery of the continent, there was this thing he had called the continental system, which he'd put in place, and he, he forced his enemies to the table at the Treaty of Tilsit, which was where he just made the rules and the rest of them had to follow. So Austria, Russia, Prussia were all just called to the table, made to sign, and they fitted in wherever he wanted them to fit in. And those wars brought significant wealth to France. You know, if you look at what, especially his original wars in Italy, that's why he got so much power. He was sending so much gold to Paris. Right. And everybody was in love with, with Napoleon Bonaparte. Yeah, the people had never been happier. French yeah. pride had been restored. You know, the revolution did huge damage to the French. Mm. And they were very much weakened and bankrupt and didn't have a lot going for them. And now suddenly they were the power in Europe yeah. again. He nearly actually got noosed, though, because... When he came back, he was pro the Jacobins. Yeah. And then after they were roped, the, the, the Robespierre's, the brothers, they were hung. And he would obviously been quite close to the one brother, Augustine. And he was very worried that he was going to be taken out. And so he kept a low profile. He went to Corsica and it died down. And he was put under house arrest for a short period of time. And then huh. they brought him in and he was, he, was, he was already back in as a general. But this is all obviously 
predating his time as this emperor. Is exactly, yeah. This is all predating his time. I didn't know that he was actually in danger at that point because they did say in the house that he'd come back for a visit. And I thought, well, that's odd. You know, you've got all mm. the stuff to do and you come to Corsica, which is a very quiet place. Not yeah. a lot happens in Corsica. But he was so intelligent. He had a finger on the pulse. He knew exactly his, his intuition was yeah. second to none. Well, they say that he was almost like one of those master chess players, that he always knew where his armies were positioned. He always knew what their defenses were, what their strategic advantages were, and he could play it all out in his head and see all the different extrapolations and figure the best one, which is extraordinary. Mm -hmm. that, that requires a very fine mind. But you mentioned how clever he was. Eventually, there was the fifth coalition. Now, imagine like you're mounting a fifth attempt to take this guy down. This one was Austria and Britain. And they did defeat him at the... Oh, sorry, he defeated them at the Battle of, of Wagram yeah. in 1809. And then he made a, a, a fairly big mistake because he decided to invade Spain and went to war there for... That I think wasn't it was, the, the Peninsula Wars. That actually hurt him. It was bad, but the idea behind it was good because, again, he wanted to throttle British trade. And the Portuguese and the Spanish really waged a guerrilla war against him. So it wasn't a standing army war, which he knew and he could win. It was much more, you know, small peasant factions that would rise up and, you know, brigands that would attack his mm. men at night. And it kept and them very busy. Mm. And I think, Gareth, you know, the big thing is, and it's a, it's a lesson that, that subsequently people haven't learned. But what happened was he, he was, the Peninsula Wars were there and it was almost terrorist-like. And then suddenly he heard that his friends, the Austrians, and he got so frustrated one day, he said, you know, these Austrians are stopping me taking on Britain. They're wasting my time so I can't tackle Britain. And he went from Spain back to Paris, and people were so – they couldn't believe he was there. He rode the horse so hard, he broke all records. And then he put together 600,000 troops. Peninsula was still ongoing, and off he went into Russia. Sure. Because Russia now well, said, no, we've, we're fed up with the European system that you've – This is what they say was his biggest mistake. Yeah. War on two fronts, and exactly. especially Russia, and especially in the winter. Yeah, and they were clever. They kept retreating, sucking him deeper and deeper into the Russian cold lands. Mm. And he won the battle just in front of Moscow. But when he got to Moscow, there was nothing there. Yeah, they, they, they'd done what they later on did with Hitler too, this slash and burn, mm. where they basically just left embers and ruins. Yeah. And, you know, a, an, advancing, policy, yeah. an advancing army needs food. They need shelter, they need fire, they need warmth, they need sustenance. They could find nothing there when they had eventually conquered Moscow. There was just nothing for them. And many people died of starvation. They had to do a humiliating march back through the snow. Lots of people died on the way back yeah. that way. They talk between forty and 100,000. So I've read a report of 100,000 out of 600 or 40,000 out of 600. But no matter what, it's massive amounts were lost. <laughs> And they say in the end, you know, he was, he was a colossus, but six million people died during that time. Importantly, though, he brought to mainland Europe liberal and strategic values. Oh, yes, absolutely. Of, of absolutely. The, the Enlightenment. I, I, want to, I want to get to those when we kind of look at him after his death, but, but to carry on with the events of his life, because it was such an in, incredible, action-packed life. So after he invades Russia, they dissolve the Grand Army. And he gets back and... There's the Sixth Coalition yes. now ready to take him on in 1813. They defeat him at Leipzig. Yeah. The Allies invade France. They take Paris. And he eventually abdicates. This is now 1814. And Talleyrand was there to say, hello, welcome to Paris. Right. So he'd already switched. He'd already turned, yeah. turned tail. Napoleon then was exiled to Elba, which is a little island off the Italian coast. And he was only there for 100 days, I think. So he was there for about, around about a year. And he was given sovereignty of it. Sorry, the 100 days when he came back. Yeah, So then, but he only lasted literally less than a year, and, and he escaped. Mm. And he took 1,000 people across the Mediterranean back into France. They welcomed him in Paris. Well, there's, a, there's an interesting story that I want to throw in just before that, and it's the most beautiful scene from a movie that I watched about Napoleon. He marches with this kind of lackluster army behind him. You know, it's the people he could rally on his way <laughs> through southern France. And one of his former generals, Marshal Ney, meets him. And this is all told exactly the way that it was written, and we have no reason to, to not believe it. Napoleon stands at the front of this motley army that he's gathered, and Ney comes down with what is the Bourbon army of the King of France, who's been reinstated. And 
Napoleon stands there right in the front, and Ney says, raise your, your guns, and when I give the order, fire on Napoleon. Napoleon strides forward, and he tells his people to lower their arms. And then Ney says, fire. And Napoleon says, soldiers, I am your emperor. If anyone wants to shoot me, go ahead. And none of them shoot. They all drop their arms. Ney loses control. And he kind of gets embraced by Ney's army. And then he has even more men to march on Paris yeah. with. And when Ney offers him his sword as a, you know, sort of a humbling, humiliating defeat and a move of, of, of supplication, Napoleon says to him, no, Ney, I need you and you need your sword. We have Paris to reconquer. And they march up to Paris. And he's really instated there for, I think, another hundred days. True to form, the Bourbon king, I think he was Louis the ran. 18th. He ran out of... Ran. He was a fat, useless, stupid yeah. king. And he ran out of and Paris. got the hell out of there. Yeah. But he didn't last long as, as emperor the second time. They it eventually, was 100 days you mentioned. Yeah, and, and the Seventh Coalition eventually defeated him at Waterloo, which is one of the most famous battles in history. Southern Belgium now. You can go and see the battlefield. Mm. And it's been played out a million times. There are games you can play where you can be Napoleon or you can be Wellington, you know, Wellington or, or Blücher of, of Prussia. And they defeated him soundly in 1815. He was taken captive and put on a ship and sent to this miserable island in the middle of the Atlantic. They were taking no chances. No. Uh, St. Helena, which is actually closer to South Africa than it is Correct, to France. Correct, in, in the southern Atlantic. They've only just recently landed planes there because you could only yeah. reach it by ship for so say, it's the a longest time. of all airlines is flying there now once a week or twice a week. Amazing. But Wellington, the Duke of Wellington, he was one of the most able generals during that period. Well, we're going to talk about him in a future episode, I think. That's correct. And what he said, they asked him, so who was the most difficult and greatest opponent that you faced? He said, Napoleon, in this era, in the past era, in any era, Napoleon Bonaparte. Wow. That's what Wellington, and Wellington was pretty handy. He died at 51 after only six years in exile in Longwood House, which was the house they put him up in, in prison. Uh, his hero, Julius Caesar, was the subject of a book he wrote. He also wrote his memoirs. He was buried in St. Helena and then later exhumed by a very embarrassed French nation who wanted to reinter him in the Invalide in Paris in a big... Roman-style porphyry tomb, which I visited. Um, it's very impressive. They now regard him as a saint. I mean, Napoleon's legacy has turned to good, after all, despite having a pretty ignominious end. But if you look at it, and this is what I really enjoyed about these incredible leaders, if we look at Julius and, and we look at Augustus, and we look at even Alexander the Great to a certain extent. So, you, you know, you always think war, war, war. But, I mean, what he did also for France, the Napoleonic Codes, I mean, it's used today still. Yeah, the Napoleonic Code of Laws is a part of the law of 70 nations in the world. It's just that's him. That was Napoleon. You know, a lot of the things that we consider the underpinnings of the modern world, I mean, things like meritocracy, you know, that the best yeah. will succeed and we should let them that there is equality before the law, that property rights are sacred, that religious toleration should happen, that secular education should be a part of practice, that sound finances should be observed. The, All idea, of these, of the idea of self-determination, national self-determination. All of these were, were championed, consolidated, codified, and spread yeah. by Napoleon. And liberal and, and rational values of the Enlightenment such as the metric system, you know, metric system of measures. They still keep the standard meter, the standard kilogram in Paris. Mm. And that's all as a result of him doing this. You know what his last words were? I don't. France, l'armée, tête l'armée, Josephine. That means France, obviously, the army, head of the army, and Josephine. Strange last words. Incredible. <laughs> they say he could have been poisoned. They found a lot of arsenic in his hair. Um, and so a lot of people say the English just kind of sped him to an early death. But what an interesting guy. And I read some other interesting info about him that you might care to know. Because, you know, a guy, guy like that, obviously, there's plenty of legend and there's lots of myth associated with him. But apparently he had a very strict, efficient work habit. 
He prioritized what needed to be done. He is very good at delegating, but he cheated at cards. He always repaid his losses. He had to win at everything he attempted or he would never attempt it again. He kept relays of staff and secretaries at work. Unlike many generals, he did not examine history to ask what Hannibal or Alexander or anyone else did in a similar situation. Critics said he won many battles simply because of luck. And he responded, give me lucky generals, arguing that luck comes to leaders who recognize opportunity and seize it. That's exactly right. And if that's the case, if you look at his strategy in the wars, Austerlich, and what he did, and how clever he was, where he picked the battlefields, he worked very, very hard to ensure where the battlefields were. Well, it's, you know, he's made his own It luck. was also his personality by that stage, because when Frederick William of Prussia, even though he outnumbered the French by 63,000 troops, heard that Napoleon was in command, and he wasn't actually, it was a mistake, he ordered a hasty retreat that turned into a rout. Mm. So the force of his personality alone could neutralize the enemy. That's incredible. No, that's reputation. Napoleon, Emperor of the French. Thanks for listening to the award-winning Blind History, brought to you by Taylor Blinds and Shutters.